Okay, let's start. Good morning. So, uh, the lectures, the recordings for lectures for last week are up online. And there's this other system where you can sort of, uh, if you see any typos or mistakes, uh, you can sort of follow the instructions that I put on Canvas to sort of submit. And then that's going to, you know, provide you 0.1%, uh, uh, sorry, 0.1% extra credit at the end of the semester. I wrote all the details uh, on uh, a specific page on Canvas, and I've added sort of like a little piece on the syllabus as well. I've up updated the syllabus accordingly. Um, so that's that. Uh, are there any questions about anything so far? The problem set, I, which I hope you started working on, or anything else? Yeah. Um, I think it was number two or something where you had like A, X1, 2, X, or B, X2, and then like, did, I, it, I was just wondering, you were saying like, what can we say about these? So I was just wondering what the back was like. Oh. So this is problem two and problem said one. It says, suppose A, B, C, and D are constants such that A is not zero and the system below is consistent for all possible values of F and G. So here A, B, C, D, and F and G are coefficients of your system. They're supposed to be numbers. And then X1 and X2 are the unknowns of the system. Um, what can you say about the numbers A, B, C, and D? Well, um, let me think. I guess your question is, what type of an answer am I expecting here? Um, well, I would say something along the lines of a, an algebraic expression. It's like, you're given, so you have um, six numbers that are anonymous um, initially, and they tell you that no matter what f and g are, you can always find a solution to this, right? That's what it means for a system to be consistent. Now, and you also know, you also have a, uh, one more further piece of information, which is that one of these numbers is non-zero. So I would suggest um, just test out a couple numbers. Like put, like fix certain numbers for A, B, C, D, E, A, B, C, D, and F and G, and see uh, what can you say about this. Now, obviously, you're going to have to use some sort of row reduction here. So, for instance, so after you have sort of like some understanding using uh, some numerical examples that you can come up with, you can sort of try to extrapolate. So, for instance, right off the bat, what I can say is that if I had this system, let me write this. Um, let me write this over here. So, this is problem set one, um, problem uh, two. So I have, um, so AX1 plus BX2 equals F, CX1 plus DX2 equals G, and we're given that this system is consistent, consistent for any F and G. And that A is non-zero. Well, I want to use row reduction. Let me put this into an augmented matrix. Um, C, D, G. Now, in order for this to have a, have a solution for any F and G, eventually I should have uh, a certain uh, uh, echelon form. Right, so for instance, if at the end of the, these row operations, I get something like this, and then these are zero, for instance, this wouldn't be consistent for any f and g, right? Because here, I wouldn't be able to use a non-zero number. So something like this doesn't happen, is what it's, what it's saying. Another piece of information uh, that you're given is that a is not zero. Well, if that is the case, I can actually sort of 
do row reduction without even thinking of these as numbers. Because a is non-zero, for instance, I can say the following. I can scale the first row by 1 over a to get here a 1. This is perfectly valid because a is non-zero. I can divide numbers by it. Okay. Now, I don't know uh, if c is zero or non-zero, but in any event, certainly I can take minus c times the first row and add it to this to get rid of this and so on. You see, you can still do row reduction, uh, but you would need to be respectful of the conditions that you're given. So by doing these row operations, what can you say? And at the end, I would want something along the lines of um, this linear relation or this sort of polynomial relation has to hold for A, B, C, D. Something like that. Does this sort of make sense now a little bit? Or? I agree, it's a question that is vaguely stated. A lot of the problems in a textbook is like this. This is from the book, so in any event. Okay, so today I'd like to discuss um, three, or maybe four, uh, concepts that are related. Linear combinations, linear spans, and linear independence. I mentioned these two at the end of last week, but it was a bit rushed and I want to do them again. I want to sort of uh, spend some more time and do some more examples. This linear independence is sort of the other side of the medallion we're going to see. So uh, I wrote down uh, much more nicely the definitions of linear combinations and linear spans, but I'm using some notation that I'm going to mention in a second. Fixed vectors v1 to vp and I have this symbol. How many of you have, have seen this before? Okay, many of you have seen this before. This is just an abbreviation for these things are, oh, sorry, this should be Rn, of course. This just means that these vectors are elements of this vector space. So this is sort of like a stylized epsilon, which is the Greek analog of the letter E. Instead of writing this, this, this is an element of that, you just write epsilon to abbreviate all this. And you see, I have the same symbol here. Fixed scalars, C1 to Cp, and this uh, R. Okay, so let me write it here. Just means um, means element of. Okay, so I fix P mini scalars, uh, P mini vectors. Um, P could be any number. And I fix, likewise, P many scalars, numbers. And then by definition, the linear combination of V1 to Vp, these vectors, with specific coefficients, C1 to Cp, is by definition this new vector. Now we discussed last week how we can take a vector, scale it, and this would be yet another vector. And likewise, I can do the same thing here. This would be yet another vector, and so on. And then I can add all of them up. Right, that's another thing I can do uh, using vectors to get yet another vector. So, and that's, if you get a vector like this, this is called the linear combination. So this is the first definition. The second definition is uh, the definition of a linear span. Now this time, I sort of like wanted to emphasize this because at first these can get uh, confusing. I again fix p many vectors in the vector space and element of, right? But I'm not fixing any scalars this time. Instead, I consider all those vectors I can write as a linear combination. Then the linear span of v1 to vp is the set. You see, it's not the vector, it's the collection of all linear combinations of v1 to vp with arbitrary coefficients. And a fast way of writing this, uh, so the notation for this is this, you write span, and then you open curly braces, and then you put your vectors in that, in this, uh, inside this curly braces. 
And this is sort of yet another way of writing this. How many of you have seen this notation before? Okay, some of you. So this is what is called the set builder notation. Um, because this is a set, um, I wanna have sort of like a notation that allows me to abbreviate things. And the way I'm, I, I use this is like this. You have open brace, close brace, and you have a bar in between. To the left of the bar, you're writing a, the, the name of a typical element. A typical element I'm denoting here by W. And to the right of the bar, you're writing the condition. Okay? So the way you write it is the, the way you read it is like this. Span of V1 to Vp is by definition the set of all those vectors W such that for some scalars C1 to Cp, W is this linear combination. This is just yet another way of writing this uh, uh, definition uh, using words, okay? Let me also record this as well. So this is a set builder notation. Let me record it over there. Uh, yeah. Actually, let me do it here. So first of all, um, so, notations for sets. Either uh, unordered list So A, B, C, as opposed to the ordered list, where we typically use uh, parentheses, use curly braces to denote unordered list, which means that this set is the same thing as, let's say, B, A, C. So it is unordered, okay? This is one uh, way of writing, and the other one is using this uh, so-called set builder notation. So you write, you, you again use uh, curly braces, but, but instead of sort of listing all of the elements, possibly you may not be able to do this, you just write the typical element and the condition. Satisfies. Satisfies property. Let's say P. You have a fixed property and that defines a set. So this is typical element in set, and this is the condition, okay? Now, for instance, you see here, I am using this, uh, this first notation where people, so the, the book uses this first notation over here. The way you're reading this really is this. You have p many vectors. You put them in a set by listing them, and then you put ne next to the set this word span. And once you put this word span on next to this, you get this new set, okay? So this word span is sort of like a modifier, if you want, of your notation, okay? Now, let's do some examples. Unless there are any questions. Yes. For the span? Yes. Do you apply the span to all of the vectors, or does like the p coefficient go with the p vector, like how it sort of seems to suggest there? Like you, you apply the span to a set of vectors. Okay. So, so I mean, you can write it that way, but um, um, you can sort of like let the coefficients absorb the redundancies. And so this is sort of like the most efficient way of writing this. Okay. We're, we're gonna see examples, numerical examples. Are there any other questions? 
OK, so let's consider this, for instance. Um, OK, let's, let's start with this. So I have three vectors, a1 is this, a2 is 2, 5, 6. Recall that the identified vectors, which by definition were tuples by column matrices, and then b is 7, 4, minus 3, okay? So the question is, can I come up with a linear combination of these two vectors to obtain b? That is to say, so let me write it like this. Can one write b as a linear combo of a1 and a2. Well, the way to answer this, or one, one of the ways to answer this, is like this. We're going to set up an equation using an expression of this form, but uh, the coefficients will be not fixed, OK? so. So in other ways, so in another way of asking this question is this: uh, Are there so i.e. are there numbers c1 and c2 such that c1 times a1 plus c2 times a2 is equal to b? OK? So in this equation, everything except the two numbers, c1 and c2, are known. OK? So this is the question. OK? So let's uh, start like this. Let me start with this, b. Let me expand it. This is 7, 4, minus 3. And then I want this to be equal to this. Okay? Let me expand a1 and a2 as well. So c1 times a1 is 1 minus 2 minus 5. Plus c2 times a2, which is 2, 5, 6. OK. Now I want to do some operations to sort of like make the right-hand side look similar to the left-hand side. Well, what I can do is this. I know that I can scale mul scalar multiply this vector by this, and likewise I can scalar multiply this vector by this. And then I can add both of these column vectors to get one column vector. So that would be sort of like uh, consolidating uh, these uh, entries. Okay. Now, but then notice that I have here one column vector and here one column vector as well. And I can really interpret, based on what we discussed last week, this as a certain matrix multiplication. Because this is literally the system C1 plus 2C2 equals 7, and then minus, C1, minus 2C1 plus 5C2 equals 4, and so on. But we know that we can write it using a matrix as well, and it would be like so. 1, um, 2, minus 2, 5, minus 5, 6. C1, C2. OK. So you see, this question of whether or not this vector is a linear combination of these two things turns out to be the same thing as a certain 
as, as, as solving a certain linear system. So can I find a solution to this? This equals to this. And I want to solve for C1 and C2. Well, you know how to do this by now. Um, let's write the augmented matrix. So 1, 2, minus 2, 5, minus 5, 6 is this coefficient. And then the right-hand side gives me oh, 7, 4, minus 3. Okay. Any questions so far? You see, I started with this new concept, this linear combination, this notion of a linear combination. And by just uh, rearranging things a certain way, I ended up with a linear system. And now I can apply my understanding from last week to solve it. Okay. Let me not uh, do the uh, row reduction here because it's written in the book. Let me just say this row reduces to this matrix. 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 3, 2, 0. OK? So now, caching this out to get, the, get back the system, we have that C1. Recall that our unknowns were C1 and C2. C1 is 3 and C2 is 2. That is to say, based on our calculations, if we use the specific numbers 3 and 2 in this linear combination, we do indeed get B as a linear combination of A1 and A2, OK? And of course, we can verify this by just computing. Um, let's just check it here. So 3 times A1 is over here. 1 minus 2 minus 5 plus 2 times A2 is 2, 5, 6. This is 3 minus 6 minus 15, and then 4, 10, 12. 7, 4, minus 3. This is exactly B. Any questions about this? So in this class, at this for quite a while, whenever you sort of encounter a, even a new uh, concept, the first thing that you should try to do is to sort of formulate it using matrices and perhaps you know, getting a system of equations. And once you can get the system of equations, uh, we can be fairly certain that we can solve it either by yourself or by using, uh, by using the book or by uh, using a system of uh, a computer algebra system or something like that. What is the, the most complicated, possibly, or most uh, conceptually taxing is this reformulation of things into a nice shape where you can do nice calculations. Okay? So once you can put something into matrix form in an appropriate way, you're pretty much uh, good to go. Often we're going to see that putting things into the right matrix form is going to be the sort of the part that requires um, creativity a little bit. Okay. So now I can write the same question using this notion of this linear span. I could also say, so this question is the same thing as this question, which is also the same question as 
is B in the span of A1 and A2. Let me write it over here too. IE is B in uh, the span of A1 and A2. Or I can even um, compress it even further and just write it using this uh, uh, set notation is B in the span of A1 and A2, question mark. Okay, these are all the same thing. And the final verdict, of course, is that it is indeed the case that B is in the span. It is indeed the case that you can write B as a linear combination of A1 and A2, and so on. Okay? So this is the algebraic perspective. Everything with it here is algebraic, but of course, uh, this also has a geometric um, intuition that corresponds to it. Let's also discuss that. And geometrically, I would suggest that this notion of a linear combination or the related sort of global notion of linear span is something about accessibility. Here's what I mean by this. So. Linear combo and span is R about accessibility. Here's an example. And just so that the geometry is uh, easier to follow, I'm just going to take a much simpler example, okay, numerically speaking. Consider these two vectors. E1 is going to be 1, 0, 0. And E2 is going to be 0, 1, 0. Okay. Now, we interpret a 2D vector as an element in the plane. So that means that we can interpret a 3D vector as an element in three-dimensional space. And thinking of this as x, this as y, and this as z, I can think of this as uh, the unit vector along the x-axis. And likewise, this is the unit vector along the y-axis. I mean, let's also write uh, E3, which is 0, 0, 1. So we have this three-dimensional space. This is x, this is y, this is z. And e1 is a vector that's pointing in the x direction. OK? And this is e2, and this is e3. Now, what is the span of E1? Just uh, writing down the definition explicitly, this is just W such that W equals C1 times E1. OK? That is to say, the span of E1 is the vectors, is all the vectors that are proportional to it. And if I wanted, I could be even more explicit, and I could say W such that W equals C1, 0, 0. So you see from the vector, if I switch over to the span, I get the whole line 
along E1. So this right here is a span of E1. Where does this accessibility come from, come into play? Well, here's how I think about this. This line is also all the positions in the three-dimensional space that I can reach to using E1 and any scalar multiple of it. So that's sort of like my velocity. I can sort of like slow down or speed up, but I cannot change directions. All the places I can go using only this is the span. Okay, does this make sense? It's sort of like a more geometric, if you want a sort of robotics type of understanding. Okay, let's look at another example. So this is example, this is the first part, let's say one. Part two is, what is the span of E1 and um, minus E1? Any ideas? Exactly. You see, there could be some redundancy. And in this case, um, there is no problem whatsoever in sort of going in this direction or going in this direction because I can think of going backward as having negative velocity. It's in the same direction, but the magnitude, so to speak, is negative. So this would be exactly the same thing as a span of E1. And of course, for instance, the span of E1 and two times E1, they would all be the same. Let's look at another example. Span of E1 and E2. Any ideas as to what this should be? Hmm? Could it be uh, like a two-dimensional plane? Exactly. But you can be even more specific. There are many two-dimensional planes, but... It's like uh, the plane that exists along the E1 axis with E2. Like, I don't know how to phrase that well, but I think you know what I mean. Yeah, yeah. So it's just, I would just call it the xy plane, okay. right? So let's again write down the definition. This is the set of all those w's such that w is c1 times e1 plus c2 times e2. Writing this out, I get that w equals c1, c2, zero. That is to say this span of E1 and E2 consists of all those vectors in three-dimensional space whose third entry is zero. Geometrically, this is just telling me that I don't have any height. I don't have any Z coordinate. It's only the XY coordinate and I can go anywhere I want there. So this says, let me just write it like this. This is also XY, XY plane in R2, uh, R3. So this plane, it's an infinite plane, okay? Because I don't have any bounds on these constants. Now, how can I interpret this in the context of accessibility? Well, I can see it like this. I can use any vector, so I can use any vector proportional to E1, and then I can use, on top of that, any vector along E2. So if I wanted, I could go C1 units along E1, let's say this much, and then I say, okay, I'm changing my mind and I wanna use this other direction. 
and I can go on top of that C2 units in this other direction. Okay, so this is C1 units and this is C2 units. Of course, I don't need to stop there, right? I could uh, say, okay, I'm going to go back a little bit and then go this way and so on. But the beauty of writing it like this is that uh, you can sort of like combine the coefficients. And at the end, even if you had sort of a couple different, uh, if you steered uh, a couple different times, at the end you can just write it, you can consolidate all those coefficients and write it just using two numbers. What I mean by this is the, is the following. So for instance, consider this. Um, this is just a continuation of the third example. For instance, consider this. I can do, I can start with one unit of E1, and then let's say I go two units of E2, and then I go back, let's say, um, three units in E1, and so on. And let's say minus two E2. So what I did here is I went one unit this way and then two units sideways. And then I decided to go back three units along the X direction. And then I decided to go two units along the Y direction. Okay? So of course at the end, the total uh, move is going from zero to this um, um, minus two, uh, E1. So you see, I can take this and this to consolidate here, and then I can take this and that to cancel them out. Okay? This is what I mean by accessibility. The span of E1 and E2 are all those positions that I can reach by using this sort of a motion. Is this sort of clear? This is sort of like the geometric intuition that I think. Uh, is uh, rather useful. Now, on the other hand, for instance, E3 is not in the span of E1 and E2, right? Because E3, by definition, has some height. But using E1 and E2, there is no way for me to access it. I cannot, get, I, I cannot gain, gain any height. So E3 would not be in the span. So this is in the span of E1 and E2, but uh, E3 is not. This is yet another notation. Instead of writing not in, I'm just going to write epsilon and then put a dash. So I cancel it out. Not in span of E1, E2, E3. OK? How about this? This is example four. Let's say E1 plus E2. This is yet another vector, and I have now three vectors. Put them in a set and then consider their span. What is this span? Any ideas? Oh, sorry. Uh, sorry. Of course. Are you are you happy now? Yes. Okay. Sorry. Good catch. Okay. How about this? What is the span of e1, e2, and this new vector e1 plus e2? Geometrically, I can think of it, of course, like this. Um, I have this vector, I have this vector, and then I have this diagonal vector, right? What is this span? Hmm? Exactly, right? Because anywhere I can go using E1, E2, and E1 plus E2, I can go using only E1 and E2. 
So in a sense, this is redundant. Just like um, minus E1 being redundant there. But for the purposes of spin, that's not an issue whatsoever. So this is again xy plane. And if you wanted to verify this algebraically, you can also write it out as well. So w equals uh, w such that w equals uh, c1 e1 plus c2 e2 plus c3 e1 plus e2. Okay, but writing this out gives me this: c1 plus c3, c2 plus c3, zero. Well, now you see the coefficients are kind of weird looking compared to what we had uh, over there. But still, all this is telling me is that I have three different numbers. But using these three different numbers, because they are put in this position, all I can get is the first two coordinates. I can access only the first two coordinates. OK? Now, this notion of redundancy or optimality, let's say, is encapsulated in this other notion, which is linear independence versus linear dependence. So fix vectors v1 to vp n are n. Don't fix any scalars. Um, by definition, they are linearly independent if um, if uh, the only Scalars C1 to Cp such that C1 V1 plus C2 V2 plus dot 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 plus Cp Vp equals zero. This is a zero, zero vector. Let me see. R, uh, the, the grammar is kind of weird here. C1 equals 0, C2 equals 0, and so on. Of course, no matter what these vectors are, if I were to choose these coefficients as 0, the end result, the linear combination, would be 0. That's not an issue. But for linear independence, you want only these coefficients to satisfy this. This is uh, sort of like a more, it's a nicer way of writing this idea that you don't want to have something like this. You don't want this, you, want, you don't want the vector to be a linear combination of some other vectors. Okay. So if you wanted, you could have said, oh, VP is not a linear combination of the other ones, and so on. But instead of sort of writing it that way, people like to sort of collect all the vectors on one side and set it equal to zero. OK, so now let's think about all these sets. Um, is this linearly independent? So um, well, algebraically speaking, I would need to sort of set up this equation. I would say c1 times e1 equals 0. 
But then if C1 times E1 equals zero, that means that C1, zero, zero, the vector equals zero, zero, zero. But then C1 has to be zero. OK? So indeed, this set consisting of only E1 is linearly independent. Geometrically, too, it, it makes sense if you think about linear independence as uh, optimality. There is no redundant vector whatsoever. If I were to not have, if I didn't have this E1, then I wouldn't be able to move at all. That, that means that this E1 is not redundant. I have to keep it. Okay. Here, in the second example, is the set E1 comma minus E1 linearly independent? Well, there is some redundancy here, which means that they should be linearly not independent, which is what people say, linearly dependent. Redundancy. gives linearly dependent. So this is one of those contexts where possibly dependency is slightly worse of a condition, or at least that's why I think about it. This, there is no redundancy whatsoever, right? Because if I were to get rid of either this or this, I would lose my ability to move. Instead of moving along two dimensions, it would turn into something like this, which means that, so it would turn into a line, which means that I wouldn't be uh, able to move as freely as possible, which means that here there's no redundancy. No redundancy. So linearly independent. Um, in that example, what do you think? Is this set linearly dependent or independent? dependent. Exactly, right? Because again, there's uh, some uh, redundancy here. So this set of vectors is linearly dependent. There's redundancy. Let's also algebraic um, um, Verify this. I'm just going to erase this part. So check. I'm setting up the equation 0 equals C1 times E1 plus C2 times E2 plus C3 times E1 plus E2. That's the third vector. Writing this out explicitly, I get that 0, 0, 0 equals C1, and then C2 here, and then plus C3, and then plus C3, and then 0. As usual, this is a linear system of equations. You see this gives me 0, 0, 0 equals C1, C2, C3, and then 1, 0, 1. 0, 1, uh, 1, 0, 0, 0. Yet another system of equations. I'm asking, what are the solutions of this? Okay. Um, well, in this case, there are infinitely many solutions, right? Because here I have a zeroed out thing. Uh, oh, wait. Sorry, there, there are no infinitely many solutions, but there is some solution. So from the third, I get that um, getting confused. Uh, sorry, there are infinitely many solutions. Sorry, the, th the first thing I said was correct. Um, you see here, this third column tells me that C3 is free. 
But once I determine what C3 is, I, I know what C1 and C2 are. So C1 is minus C3, and so is C2. And C3 is free. That is to say, for instance, um, my, uh, one, one minus one is a solution. So, you see, we set up this equation, but we didn't end up with this solution. We were able to find a different solution. Whenever you can do this, that means that they are linearly dependent. Okay. Any questions? Two questions, uh, but we're out of time. So maybe I'll stick around and you can ask your questions. Thank you. I'll see you tomorrow. Okay, let's start. Good morning. So today, uh, we're going to talk about the third big actor in this class, linear transformations. But before going into that, I wanted to uh, just summarize these two concepts, related concepts, linear span and linear independence. And I wanted to introduce some more notation. Let's start with this. Um, so this includes two things. First of all, just like we have Rn as a notation for uh, the vector space of n tuples, we have here yet another notation. This is not very common, but it is fairly common. Uh, this is not as universal as, as Rn, but it is uh, fairly universal. And I'm just going to write it like this. So the set of all matrices with m many rows and n many columns is denoted like this m open paren m times n and then here i record uh, where the entries are coming from so the entries are real this is how i denote it and using this uh, set builder notation that we discussed yesterday i can write it as uh, like that as well All right so m of m times n comma r is the set of all those a's such that a is of this form. Now, here I sort of wrote down a matrix in abstract notation, but this uh, is something that you're going to have to get used to in this class. This is sort of like the typical way of indexing entries of matrices. So I have a two-dimensional array, typically speaking, and because of that, I'm going to use two indices. And this is universal. The first index is always going to tell you the row, right? So this is the first row. You see, the first index in the first row is always one, and then in the, set, the uh, first, in this, first index in the second row is always two, and so on. And then the second index is going to tell you the column. That is to say, if I were to look at the entry a i j, this really is the entry of a at the i j entry. Okay, this is always going to be the case. Well, at least for the purposes of math um, and probably also physics. Of course, in computer science, people like to start indexing from zero, but uh, in math, we start indexing from one. Okay. So, um, using this notation now, let me write down the sum summaries. Um, let A be a matrix in M by N comma R. Right? This is just a fast way of writing. A is an M by N matrix. Um, with uh, with uh, columns, A1, A2, dot, 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 A, N. 
Now, what does this mean? Here, what I did was, was the following. I took an A in this uh, set of matrices, and I said, each of these columns, I'm not going to expand them. I'm just going to write, for instance, for this column, just A1. And for this column, A2, and so on. First column, second column, and then the nth column. So another way of writing this would be this. This is also common. Instead of writing all the, ex all the uh, entries, I can also write it like so. So So this is entry-wise, or I can write it like this, uh, A1. And then I like to put sort of like vertical uh, lines to tell me that the A1 is this column, and then A2, and so on. And I should also mention that um, at first, when you're uh, starting to uh, you know, use matrices, there's this feeling, there's this you know, expectation in the back of your head that it shouldn't be this hard to write things down, but often it's going to be the case that it is hard to things. It is hard to write things down. It's like it takes a while, and so uh, eventually you're going to get uh, rather fast. You're going to learn how to write these type of things very fast. Okay. So this first sentence literally just means this: I have an M by N matrix, and instead of considering each of these entries, I'd like to sort of lump together each of these columns separately. Okay? Then the following are equivalent. And let me also introduce an abbreviation here that is uh, used very commonly. Instead of writing the following are equivalent, I'm just going to write the first letters. OK? 1, 2, um, OK. Made a mistake. Need to back down a little bit. Or maybe I should just add it here. And let B uh, be a vector in Rn. Uh, sorry, M. OK? Um. Yes, that's correct. First statement is B can be written as a linear combination of these columns. They are vectors after all. B can be written as a linear combination of A1, A2, and so on, up to An. This is the first statement. This statement is equivalent to saying that B is in the span of A1 to An. So these are the two conceptual ways of thinking about this. The third one is the um, more computational uh, statement that AX equals B as a solution. Okay, this is a summary. Now what does this tell me? This tells me that if uh, you encounter the question of whether or not uh, 
a vector is in the span of some other vectors, you can just take those vectors, put them in a matrix, and try to solve this equation. If it has a solution, then yes. If it doesn't have a solution, then the answer is no. Okay? For the solution x. Let's do some dimension counts. Now, if I uh, lump together entries in each column, note that each of these uh, columns are going to be m-dimensional vectors, right? So here I have n vectors, each of which is m-dimensional. So each AI is an R M. It has M dimensions, each of them. So if I were to take a linear combination of them, I would get back an M dimensional vector. And that's why I needed B to be in R M. Okay? On the other hand, this vector has to be n dimensional okay um, this is just a summary of what we did but maybe I should expand this uh, to just verify that this is indeed sort of uh, the case um, so what is this let's write it out explicitly so this is a11 all the way up to A1n, and then A21, all the way up to A2n, dot, 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 AM1, all the way up to AMn, and then I just told you that x has to have n different entries, so let's write it like this, x1, x2, dot, 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 xn. But we just said last week that this is just another way of writing uh, a certain system of linear equations, all I need to do is to match the corresponding entries. Okay? So A11x1 plus A12x2 plus dot 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 A1nxn. This is the first row. Second row is A21x1 plus A22x2 dot 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 A2nxn. And then a uh, m1 x1 plus a m2 x2 plus dot 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 a m n x n. I want this to be equal to b. B has m uh, different entries, which means that the first one I want to be equal to, let's say, b1 and then b2, and so on. Now, the reason why this is related to the other conditions is because, you see, once I write it like this, I can split this into each of these sums. Right? This was something that we discussed. We can um, add vectors, and then because this x1, for instance, is repeating, I can take it out as a scalar. And likewise, this x2 is repeating here, I can take it out as a scalar and so on. Uh, I don't have space here, so let me uh, keep writing it over here. Uh, of course, when I bring this down, it's going to be down. Um, so if I take this matrix, I can split the sums, reverse engineering, vector addition, um, a11x1 dot dot dot, am1x1 plus a21, sorry, a12x2 dot dot dot, a m2x2 
dot 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 a 1 n x n dot 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 a m n x n right if this is my matrix I can certainly split these sums like this but then once I split it like this I can also pull out these constants as scalars let me just do it here so this is times x1 this is times x2 this is times xn that is to say you see a times x really is this specific linear combination and and this is what uh, this is what relates these three statements okay and you see all I'm doing is I'm just paraphrasing the same expression using sort of using the same type of terminology and it allows me to sort of come up with different formulations of basically the same thing now it's going to turn out that given a problem uh, probably one of these uh, formulations is going to be more convenient but in any event in this class uh, you're going to need to learn how to switch from one formulation to the other one by just manipulating symbols okay any questions about this What do you mean by that? Like if you had a, a row that was like 20, 22 long and a column that was 23 long. Okay. Um, and you were at 22, 23. How would you know like which one you're at? Or even more extreme, like 100. Um, you could be at 21 and 3, or you could be at uh, 2 and 13. Like how would you split up the rows and columns like at the M and N notation? Um, Oh, I see. Okay. What is not universal is this. Okay. This is universal. If you have two indices, the first one is always going to be the row. The second one is always going to be the column. But when you split it into rows or columns, that's up to you. Okay. That depends on the field. Okay. So typically, so if you're more physics oriented, uh, you would use subscripts for columns and then you would use superscripts for rows. Uh, because somehow, uh, from a physical point of view, columns turn out to be related to velocities, whereas rows turn out to be related to momentum or momenta. Um, but there is no there is no universality here. So here you can denote it however you want, as long as it is consistent, it should be good. Yeah. So this is sort of one thing that is different in math. We're just like very villainilly when it comes to notation and indices. Um, any other questions? Yeah, so for instance, another thing I like doing is that if the number of entries is low, I really don't like using these indices. I just use like A, B, C, D, E, E, F, G and stuff. Right? So, or alpha, beta, gamma, whatever. It's just faster to write things down. But of course, it doesn't scale really because you have only so many letters. Any other questions? Okay, so this is the summary for linear span. Let's write down a, a similar uh, summary for linear independence. So a couple of these statements, again, is going to be abstract, more sort of conceptual, and one of them is going to be computational. Okay, and again, I'm going to start with uh, a matrix. Let A be an M by n matrix with columns uh, a1, a2, dot, 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 an. And as before, uh, these are going to be uh, vectors in Rm. OK? Um, okay. Then the following are equivalent. Using this abbreviation, like I mentioned, 
These vectors are linearly independent. And recall, yesterday we mentioned how linear independence is really about redundancy, or perhaps I should say it the other way around. Linear independence is about non-redundancy, uh, and dependence is about redundancy. Uh, these are linearly independent. Okay. None of these vectors can be written as a linear combination of all the other ones. Um, no AI can be written as a linear combination of all the other ones. So maybe I should write it like this. Third, another way of saying this is um, it up top. Easier. AI is not in the span of AJ such that J is not equal to I. They are the same thing, two and three. Recall that this was element of, and when I put a dash through it, it's opposite, not an element of. And then finally, um, the fourth one is going to be the computational one. The only solution to a x equals uh, zero is zero. Okay. So now let's be mindful of the dimensions. So this zero is a certain zero vector. Um, so this is in, uh, just like we discussed here, in M, our M. Whereas this zero is in our N. So more explicitly, this one I would write as this column vector with M entries. And this I would denote uh, like this. It would be, it will look the same, but this has m entries, this has n entries. Okay? Now, one thing people like doing, um, just to keep track of the dimensions faster, is to do this. Whenever they take an m by n matrix, they put here, the number of rows, and here, the number of columns. So let's say that these, uh, uh, these entries are populated with actual numbers, and you don't actually see the dimensions. So you just put M here and N here. There's also a more, uh, perhaps, important reason for that, and it turns out to be rather useful to keep track of the dimensions. So for instance, here I can write it like this, M by 1, N by 1, okay? Linear span, a couple of different conceptual uh, expressions, and then a uh, computational um, statement that is equivalent, and likewise here. And again, if you're asked to see if, to, to verify or confirm uh, whether or not a certain uh, set of vectors uh, is linearly independent, what you can do is you can put them in a matrix and solve this equation. If you can find a non-zero solution to it, and that means that they are not linearly independent, which means that they are linearly dependent. Perhaps I should record that down as well. 
um, not linearly, linearly independent is the same thing as linearly dependent. Okay? And of course, vice versa. Any questions about these two? Yes. So with linear independence, if you had a matrix and you looked at the first column and the second column and we said these, these columns or these vectors are independent of one another, what that would mean is that if the first vector had like an x component, that would mean that the second vector uh, probably does not have an x component. And the reason is because you could, if it did, you could multiply it by some scalar to get to the same place the first vector got to. That's kind of what uh, I mean, it's not like do you have only two columns in your matrix or there more? There are only two columns, there are only two rows, only x and y. Okay, two by two. Yeah. Okay, yes, in that case, yes. Okay, right but if you had more columns, you wouldn't be able to say that. Because perhaps there are more complicated linear combinations that allow you to sort of get rid of entries. Sure. That is why we have this row reduction stuff that we discussed in week one. You see, whenever you have a question about span, linear independence, turn it into a linear system problem and solve it. And likewise here, turn it into a linear system problem and solve it. And basically all of this stuff is, is basically saying, hey, if, we, if we're talking about linear spans or linear independence, then all of these properties hold true. And if you want to prove that something is or isn't yes. a span or yes. is or isn't independent, then just basically try to apply these properties. And if they fail, it doesn't. Yes. Not. Yes. So now the question here is that why did I... Uh, go through all that trouble of, you know, writing down the definitions and so on. Whereas I could have just said, you know, just the third property is what defines a span. You know, we, all, we know how to solve linear systems. We were familiar with it. And likewise here, I could have just said, you, if the only solution to uh, the matrix that you obtain by putting a bunch of vectors together uh, is zero, then they are linearly in independent. The problem perhaps with that is that uh, sometimes uh, a more abstract point of view turns out to be more useful. Like you don't want to, um, you don't want to have the requirement of always thinking about matrices and equations. Sometimes you want sort of like this flexibility of thinking about things in abstract. So that's why. Any other questions? Okay. Let me also mention this. <laughs> Since we're thinking of um, I'm just going to write it here. Since we're thinking of vectors in Rn as column vectors, so a typical element here uh, looks like this. It's an, it's an ordered n-tuple. But we're thinking of these as elements in n by 1. Right? This is, according to this new notation, is the notation for the set of all uh, column vectors. So this is just yet another way of writing the same space, at least for now. Okay. Now, there is some subtlety in this, uh, whatever this is, this wiggle, but we're going to get to that in around uh, week eight. For now, let's just, uh, like we said before, let's just leave it at saying that we can identify Rn and this no matrix space. Let's just say it that way. Any questions? Yes. Listen, what is like so when you when you write the nx one uh, of like one dimension, what is the, the u? Is Say again? What is the is that a u in front of it? Like what, what does that mean? Oh that's an M. That's a curly M. What is, what does it mean though? Is 
matrix. M4 matrix. <laughs> yes. R for real, M for matrix. Okay, so now let's introduce the third actor, linear transformation. So, so far, we were thinking of matrices like these um, only in the context of linear systems. We said that, for instance, let me just write this out explicitly again. We said that, for instance, we start with a system of equations like this. It's a system of equations, general uh, system of equations. So here, A, I, J, and B, um, I are known, and X, uh, J are unknown. Right? This is how we started last week. I didn't write it this. Uh, in its abstract notation, but this was the type of stuff that we were looking into. And one of the things that we learned was to look at the augmented matrix. We, we pretty much got rid of these uh, unknowns and we put all the knowns into one matrix. Another thing we said was to use the matrix notation. And in the matrix notation, uh, this became like this. I stored all the coefficients on the left-hand side in the configuration that I see them in A, and it turned out to be exactly this matrix. And then I stored all the unknowns in this column matrix. And then I stored all the knowns in the right-hand right -hand side in this uh, other column matrix. And now using this um, dimension count uh, tool here, what we can do is the following. I know that I have m equations and n unknowns, right? m many equations, n many unknowns. And so, and when I turn it into, when I store all this information in this, in this matrix notation, I have that A has m rows and n columns. So I can write it like this. But then x, has n entries, and it's a column matrix. That is to say, it has n rows and one column. Okay, And at the end, I get something that has m rows and one column. Okay, So this is sort of the benefit of writing these dimension numbers this way. You see, uh, somehow writing these numbers as subscripts before or after allows us to sort of uh, see uh, which matrices can be put next to each other. That is to say, uh, in a sense, I have A with MN, and then X with N1, and then when I put them together, I get something uh, such that its dimensions have the exterior dimensions here. Okay? They are like Lego pieces, if you want. So I have here... A, M, N, and then N, X, 1. Put these two Lego pieces together so that these two sort of cancel out, and you get something 
called AX, and it is going to be, it is going to have dimensions M1, okay, which is exactly B. Now, we also have this understanding that this vector is an element in n-dimensional space in Rn. And this is an element in the m-dimensional space Rm. If that is the case, I can interpret this A as something that takes n-dimensional inputs and produces m-dimensional outputs. That is to say, I can think of A as a linear transformation. You see, just like a vector is a special kind of matrix, a linear transformation too is a special kind of matrix, at least for now. So let me write it like this. Um, if A is a matrix of dimensions m by n, I can think of think of let's say A x equals y as saying as A. transforming um, the vector x in Rn to the vector y in Rm. Because of this, I'm going to think of uh, matrices in this uh, set as transformations from Rn to Rm, okay? Um, a linear transformation from Rn so R M is an M by N matrix. Okay? And just like we defined, we introduced this notation for matrices. Let me introduce a notation for linear transformations. I'm going to denote this by L of R N semicolon R M. Set of all all linear transformations. From R N to R M. So you see, let me write down here this um, let me draw this table of the main actors of this class. So main actors. Of 2270 matrices. Typically like this. 
It's the first. Second, vectors. Third, linear transformations. And they are all related in the sense that really everything, all matrices are certain vectors and likewise certain linear transformations. All vectors are certain matrices and likewise certain linear transformations. And all linear transformations are, are likewise certain matrices and really vectors as well. Now this is confusing to say, but this, uh, I just wanted to say it because it really points to this self-referential uh, structure of linear algebra. This is what makes it very useful, but at the same time confusing to, to learn. Okay. Now we're just going to keep unpacking how these are related in the coming weeks. But for now, we have sort of stable interpretations of all of these. Okay. I have vectors. I'm thinking of, that, thinking of them as column vectors. I have uh, Linear transformations, I'm really thinking of matrices, and matrices are what they are really. Um, any questions about this? I know this is confusing, uh, but uh, you have to start getting confusing to unpack things. Yes, yes. Yeah, L for linear transformation, M for matrix, and you don't put anything for vectors. This is also fairly common. This is probably more common than this notation, actually. Okay, so now let's uh, provide some um, geometric uh, intuition as to why it would be a good idea to think of these linear transformations, or other matrices that, as linear transformations. And the best thing to do, I think, is to just focus on the case when both M and N are two. That is to say, linear transformations from the plane to the plane. This is in particular very important in, for instance, computer graphics in other places. And of course, it allows you to draw a lot of pictures uh, two by two matrices. as linear transformations of the plane are two. Okay, let's start with this for instance. These are, ju these, these are just gonna be a bunch of examples. Okay, let's start uh, like so. Consider A, one, zero, zero, one. How can I interpret this geometrically? So I have the plane, x, y, and I apply A to it, and I get something else. Recall that vectors I can interpret as uh, column matrices. So the way I see where things go from here to there, under A, all I would need to do is to just put the entries here. So A, um, B is going to be 1, 0, 0, 1. And let's say that the entries of B are X and Y, general. Based on our uh, conventions, this is nothing but X and Y. OK? Right? 1 times x plus 0 times y, uh, according to this uh, 
notation. That is to say, A literally doesn't do anything. Now in math, uh, even though something doesn't do, doesn't do something, it turns out to be good to have some notation for it, just like the you know, number zero. When you add zero to other things, it doesn't do anything, but it's still uh, a good thing to have a notation for. This was actually a big breakthrough back in the day. Uh, so you see, this matrix, this two by two matrix, is what I would call the identity transformation. Don't do anything. It doesn't do anything. Is this clear? How about Let's say two zero zero one. How can I think of this geometrically? How can I describe what this transformation is doing to the plane? Any ideas? Yeah. Exactly. So you're taking the plane and you're expanding the x direction by a factor of two. That's what it does. So AV is two zero zero one times xy. Multiplying this, I get two x and y. So it doesn't give any vector input. It doesn't change the second coordinate, but it scales the first coordinate by a factor of two. Uh, perhaps I can write it like this. Let's say that this is the unit square. This is 1, 1. If I apply a to it, what used to be this now is stretched like this. Okay? Here's another example. Um, let's say Two zero zero one over three. What can we say about this? Any ideas? So this will just expand the x coordinates. It also, uh, I guess, it scales the y coordinates by one third. Exactly. Exactly. So you're stretching the x coordinate. You're squishing the y coordinate. So if I were to start with this unit box. So if this is 1, 1, and then this is 2, you see, we'll turn into this. This is sort of like a visualization, a visualization aid, right? Like it's a, this A is not really transforming only this square. It's transforming the whole plane. But just as a sample, I'm telling you what it does to this unit box. Any questions about these two? I'm going to call such transformations diagonal, right? For obvious reasons, it has entries only in the diagonal, and otherwise it has zeros. These are sort of like the easiest uh, linear transformations to understand. Let's think more. Let's say minus one, zero, zero, one. How can I think of this geometrically? Exactly. Right? So writing down the expression, I have minus one, zero, zero, one, xy. 
This is just minus xy. So again, you're not doing anything with the second coordinate, but you're flipping the first coordinate. Um, okay, so one, one. And gonna, let me put a smiley face here. It's like this. If you apply a to it, vert, um, the vertically, it's not gonna, nothing's gonna happen. But horizontally, this has to go that way. Okay. Okay. Now tomorrow, we're going to keep uh, sort of building this intuition using more two by two matrices. We're going to go beyond diagonal matrices. Rotations and shears are the other two uh, very important classes of two by two matrices that you should be uh, aware of. And then we're going to learn two more uh, concepts, ontoness and one to oneness. But I think it's a good place to stop now. Thank you. Okay, let's start. Good morning. Uh, so, uh, problem set one is due tonight. Uh, please don't forget to uh, fill in the Google form associated to it. You have a link to it uh, on the problem set specification. Problem set two is already up also. Uh, that's due next week. Um, that's all I wanted to say. Perhaps I should ask, are there any questions about problem set one? Yeah. Is it all right, um, like, regard, like regarding the formatting of submitting it to you? Yeah. Like scan photos of work or? Yeah, yeah. Anything that is listed in the grade scope documentation is valid. Okay. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay. Um, I've also changed uh, the chalk a little bit. Uh, I got the good chalk. Um, we'll see if that's going to work out better. So today, I'd like to uh, talk a bit, talk uh, um, about a couple more examples of this two by two transformations. That is to say, linear transformation. Sorry, two by two matrices. That is to say, linear transformations of the plane. Um, but before going into that, I think it would be a good idea to uh, start talking about axiomatics. Okay, there is a way of defining a linear transformation axiomatically, not in terms of a matrix. And this is gonna come in handy, and that's why I wanted to mention it. Um, so we're sort of piece by piece, we're sort of turning everything more abstract, and this is like one piece of the, of the equation, if you, if you will. So we said that a linear transformation is a matrix, but now this is a more abstract way of defining a linear transformation. In a couple of weeks, when we come to uh, Um, week seven, we're also going to have a definition that is axiomatic for vector spaces. For now, we're using these vector spaces, the very concrete vector spaces, but uh, eventually we're going to axiomatize that as well. And the way you do, the way you define a linear transformation axiomatically is, in a sense, functionally, right? We said that um, um, you can do two things with vectors. You can vector add and you can scalar multiply. Well, a linear transformation is just a function that respects these two things that you can do with, a ve uh, with, with vectors. So axiomatic, axiomatic here also means, um, let me just put it here, functional. So you're defining something in terms of what it does, not how it looks like. Okay, so this is, this is the axiomatics. And if you wanted to sort of have a picture for this, um, you could think of it like, the, like this. So let's say that I'm just gonna draw a plane, but um, this is like a caricature. And here again, I'm drawing a plane. Uh, but again, it's a caricature. I'm not meaning here. N has to be 2 and M has to be 2. If I have um, here, let's say, V, recall we think of vectors as, um, sorry, we think of vectors as arrows starting from uh, the origin, ending at whatever coefficients you have inside 
your vector. And let's say that this is w. And we know by now that v plus w is the vector that I obtained by adjoining these arrows. I can take this arrow, for instance, and add it here, and I get some other point. Right? So this is v plus w. Now when I apply t to this uh, vector space, v goes somewhere, it goes to t of v. w goes somewhere, it goes to um, t of w. And of course, t of v plus w is yet another vector over here. What I'm saying is that these three vectors are similarly, similarly related. So let's say that this is t of v, and let's say that this is t of w. I know that using the vector space structure in this space, I can add this and this, and geometrically, it would be this particular vector. So this would be t of v plus t of w. The first condition over there tells me that instead of first sending over these vectors and then adding them up in this space, what you can do is you can first add them up and then send over the result. Okay, so. This is V plus W, and this too is its image. Okay, and there's a similar thing going on with scalar multiplication. Um, so let me just draw it on a different plane. Uh, on a different board. Say I have here the vector v. If I apply my transformation, it goes somewhere else. Let's say it goes here. This is t of v now. And if I use a scalar c to scale my vector by you know, c, I get this new vector that is pointing in the same direction, but has different length, c times v. And I can likewise apply my transformation to this to go somewhere. Okay. The second property there that we wrote tells me that instead of first scaling the vector and then send, sending it to the other side using t, I can first send the vector to get t of v and then scale that ve vector by c, by the same unit. Okay? So it, in order for a transformation to be linear, it has to, it has to respect vector addition and scalar multiplication, the two things that you can basically do with vectors, okay? So for instance, um, let's consider, um, say, T from R to R is a linear transformation, is linear, okay? I may just stop saying transformation. Linear, saying something is linear, just means it's a linear transformation. Now, based on what we discussed on Wednesday, this is from R to the one to R to the one, which means that it is given by a one by one matrix. That is to say, it is given by a number, right? That's our understanding coming from Wednesday. So how can I figure out that this t is completely determined by one number? Well, I can do the following, for instance. I can realize that t of x, x is a number, 
This is the same thing as t of x times 1. Now, think of this as a vector, and this is a scalar. OK? So. This is a vector, and this is a scalar. But based on the second property over there, I know that if I have something like this, I can pull out the uh, scalar. So I can write it like so, x times t of 1. Now what this t of 1 is, it's a number, and this completely determines any other value uh, of t. Okay. So, this is a number. This is a number. It completely determines T, the transformation T. That is to say, t is given by a one by one ma matrix. So let me write it here. So, i.e., t is given by a one by one matrix. Okay? So the two interpretations, the two way of thinking of uh, thinking about linear transformations, they match up. Now in the book, they make a big deal out of this. Uh, they say, oh, there's a linear transformation, there's, and there's something called the standard matrix of a linear transformation. We have been already using the so-called standard matrix, um, so I'm not really going to introduce that terminology. Let's just leave it like this. You can think of a linear transformation as a matrix, or abstractly like this. Okay. So for instance, if I were to do the same thing with 2 by 2, so say I have a linear transformation that is linear, based on what we discussed on Wednesday, this should be given by a 2 by 2 matrix. How can I figure that out? Well. I know that the inputs here are tuples, they're pairs, so it is like this. And I can write this input, maybe I should write it like so. Okay, I can write x comma y as the following. Um, x comma 0 plus 0 comma y. But then, using the first property over there, I can split this. But then I can take this scalar out as well. You see, this says x times 1 comma 0. And likewise, this says y times 0 comma 1. And then now, using the second property, I can pull out these constants. OK? That is to say, if I tell you what this particular vector is and what this particular vector is, then you know all there is to know about t. Okay. These two vectors completely determine the transformation T. OK? 
here. So they're the same thing. So now let me ask you, from this, how do I get the matrix? I'm still not seeing any matrix whatsoever. Where is the matrix? Or how can I obtain the matrix? Any ideas? Yeah. Exactly, yeah. So, um, so what your colleague is suggesting is that T is going to be represented by a two by two matrix, and I know that uh, when I apply a matrix to x, y, I get x times the first column plus y times the second column, which means that somehow this has to go into the first column and this has to go, go into the second column, which doesn't make sense because both of these are vectors. Both of them have two numbers in them, right? So let me write it like this. T of 1, 0, let's say, is the vector um, a11, a21, and t of 0, 1 is the vector a12, a22. Now, using matrices, I would write it like this, right? So I have here this um, unknown 2 by 2 matrix. And when I put here 1, 0, I get a11, a21. And likewise, I have this uh, matrix such that when I put next to it 0, 1, I get a12, a22. Okay? Now, if I have four entries here, and I had here x and y, let's say, well, I know that I would sort of go like this, right? and then this way. But since this is 0, I'm literally, when I'm doing this multiplication, I'm literally zeroing out whatever is here. And I'm not doing anything with the first column, which means that this first column has to be the same thing as this. Okay. So this has to be like this. Then you don't know this from this equation. And then once you look at this equation, likewise, you get an idea as to how the second column should look like. It should uh, duplicate this. But then the first equation gives you the first column, second equation gives you the second column. That is to say, I have everything. So, so T is A11, A12, A21, A22. So again, the two, the two perspectives match. Either you can think of uh, linear transformations as abstract functional things, or you can think of them as matrices. Any questions about this so far? Now, the benefit of this axiomatic perspective is that, you know, sometimes um, you have matrices and you can really just think of a linear transformation as a matrix, but sometimes you encounter something that is not in matrix form, but that somehow operates this way, okay? And then you can say, oh, you know, this is a linear transformation, so I can think of it as a matrix. It's all about how things are presented to you, given your problem at hand. So it's important to be able to recognize these functional properties. Any questions? I think this chalk is uh, much more successful. <laughs> you know, from uh, my perspective, I actually can't read this uh, top side using the, uh, the, the, the other chalk because of the light. But this one I can read, so that's good. <laughs> okay. Now that we have this 
uh, discussed, let's go back to geometric interpretations of 2 by 2 matrices. So uh, on Menzé, we discussed these um, diagonal matrices. Right? These diagonal matrices are matrices that preserve the x-coordinate and the y-coordinate. It does something to the x-coordinate quite possibly, and it does something to the y-coordinate quite possibly, but there's no, for instance, rotation. And so here is uh, another example. So back to... Um, Two by two matrices as linear transformations. So here's an example. Let's consider this non-diagonal matrix. Let's say it is 0, 1, 1, 0. How can I think of this matrix geometrically? I think the first column is like x0, y1, and the second column is x1, y0. Yes. So what does that mean? Sure, but tell me something geometric. Half of a square. Uh, say again? Rotation. Um, well, it's not quite a rotation. Is it like you, uh, you move in the y direction and then move in the x direction? Um, there is some motion, of course, but uh, that's not quite the word I would use for this situation. Yeah. Exactly, yeah. So think of it like this. I mean, perhaps you were thinking of it uh, already like this, but maybe I just didn't understand your description. So if I feed to A, A is a transformation, x, y, what happens here? It zeroes out the x in the first coordinate and gives me back y, and likewise in the second coordinate, it zeroes out y, gives me x. So this shuffles the coordinates. In other words, if I were to feed to it, if I were to feed to it, 1, 0, under my transformation, 1, 0 is going gonna, is gonna to go to 0, 1. And vice versa, 0, 1, the vertical vector, now becomes a horizontal vector. OK? Now, the reason why this is not a uh, rotation is because the orientation, orientation is wrong. Right? There's no way for you to turn this around so that in the counterclockwise direction, first you see um, uh, red and then blue in the image. It's the other way around. That's why it's not the rotation. Does this kind of make sense? Quite possibly you guys had, the, had a similar idea. So, um, you know, it interchanges the coordinate systems. If I wanted to be even more geometric, I could have said that this uh, linear transformation is nothing but a reflection along the line y equals x, right? If I were to take this axis, so this is y equals x, and then flip everything, I would get this picture. Does this make sense? Okay. 
So I can just say that this is a reflection. along y equals x. OK. So you see, algebraically speaking, we just were looking at uh, a matrix that is non-diagonal. That is to say, it was a matrix that a priori was not preserving the x-axis or the y-axis. It does something more, slightly more complicated. It interchanges them. OK. Now let's think about a rotation. How about a rotation by 90 degrees in the counterclockwise direction? Instead of starting with the matrix, let's just start with uh, a description and try to come up with a matrix for it. So example, A. Um, rotates the plane by 90, well, um, what was it, pi over 2 degrees in the counterclock uh, y's direction in the counterclock direction, counterclockwise. That is to say, if I start with um, this red vector, which is horizontal, and this blue vector, which is vertical, I want to apply my matrix A to it so that now, everything gets rotated. So that now, this becomes a vertical uh, vector, and this becomes horizontal, pointing in this direction. Now, how can I come up with my four numbers, right? In order to define, or in order to determine a two by two transformation, I need four numbers. Any ideas? Well, let me say it like this. Say again? Oh, yes. Zero, negative one. Let me have a look. So, is it like this? Zero, negative one, one, zero. Oh. What do you think? Is this correct or no? I would ask that it work. Yeah, sure. Um, let me just say that it is indeed correct. And Indeed, your colleague merely used, let's say, this board over here. You see? If I know where my transformation takes 1, 0 and 0, 1, I have everything, and vice versa. So in, in this picture, I know these numbers, really. And so if I know these numbers, I can put them in a matrix. Let me be more explicit. This. Uh, Red vector is 1, 0. I'm telling you that A takes 1, 0 to this vector, 0, 1. A takes 1, 0 to 0, 1. And this is the second vector. This is a vector 0, 1. And I'm telling you here, A takes 0, 1 to minus 1, 0. So let me write it like this. This first column is where 
uh, a takes one zero. And the second column is where a takes 0, 1. OK? Is this, uh, does this make sense now? So these two are uh, sort of writing down the same thing, or describing the same thing using different notation. Um, there's one uh, issue here that I'm sort of brushing under the rug for now, uh, which we're going to start discussing uh, in um, week eight, which is that I'm sort of like assuming something in order to transition between linear transformations, axiomatically defined things, and matrices. And that is that I assume for now that I have this x and y coordinate system. Later on, we're going to learn how to think of vector spaces without this frame. And really, it's going to turn out that it has any vector space has many frames. And which matrix a linear transformation corresponds to depends on the frame with which you're looking at the vector space. Okay? This is going to uh, add some complexity of our to our calculations. But for now, we just have the x, y coordinate, x, y, z coordinate, and so on. Okay? Any questions about this? Yes. Yes. Um, now think of it like this. I don't want to go too much into detail about this for now, but um, When I see, so this notion of different frames, when I when I look at the matrix, when I when I look at the column vector, for instance, two one, so far we were immediately interpreting this as, oh, this is a point in the plane whose x coordinate is two and y coordinate is one. It's this point, and in arrow notation, it's this arrow. Okay. So this is what we what we've been doing so far. But uh, within this notation, there is no reference to the x coordinate nor to the y coordinate. Maybe I have some other coordinate system in my head. Maybe I have this coordinate system. Um, okay. So when I write this matrix, what I really mean is that I have two units of red and one unit of blue. Now it's a different place, you see? So. Two units of red, one unit of blue. So if, let's say that this is uh, y equals x. So if I were to look at this point, its length would be 1 plus 1 is 2 divided, uh, taken square root, is root 2. Let's say that I normalize it a little bit. So 1 is somewhere here. Okay? And so one unit of this, two units of this.
you see now in this different frame, the same matrix corresponds to a different vector. Okay? Now, of course, the same vector is here as well, but its numerical representation is different with respect to this new frame. Okay? So different frame. Coordinate system, frame, basis, these are all the same thing. Yeah. Uh, you had a question, yeah. Um, for the transformation, yes. like over there, for that uh, long right for it, can we do the same thing we did with A where you do like T times X, Y, and then figure out the coordinates that way? Yeah, yeah. I mean, if I, like, if I wanted, I could have just used the letter T there. It doesn't matter. Okay. It's just that this is sort of like a psychological thing, I think. When people are uh, thinking of matrices, they like to use A, B, and so on. When they're thinking of transformations, they, they like to use T, S, and so on. Gotcha. But it's like psychological. You can use any letter you want. Um, the A on the right. Uh, oh, I see. I see what you mean. Uh, and that is what gives us the transformation. The oh, yes, yes. I see. I see what you mean. I see what you mean. Yes. So, so if I, so this would be this. I see. Sorry. So this would be uh, 0, minus 1, 1, 0, x, y, which is minus y, x. This is how I can write it, and in transformation notation, using tuples, I would write it like so. These are all the same thing, okay? So you see, we think of vectors as either tuples or column vectors. Consequently, either a linear transformation is something that transforms tuples to other tuples, or it's a matrix that transforms column vectors to column vectors. What is fascinating here is that there's billion, there are a billion ways of writing the same thing, but somehow, no matter which notation you use, they all end up corresponding to each other. So, any other questions? Okay. Let's generalize this previous example. Let's say I don't want to fix um, the angle of my rotation. I want to say it's a rotation by theta degrees. So theta from 0 to 2 pi, right? Um, let's write it like so. And I want, I'm going to use a specific notation, r sub theta. I want this to be rotation by theta degrees. Now, compared to this example, here I'm not saying in the counterclockwise, counterclockwise direction. Um, if you don't see any such expression, if they just see, say rotation, at least in the two-dimensional case, you should always think of it as in the counterclockwise direction. This is sort of like a convention. Otherwise, people would explicitly say in the clockwise direction. So the clockwise direction for math, it seems uh, not the, uh, the choice, the standard choice. Okay. I'm going to apply the same trick of looking at where 1, 0 goes and where 0, 1 goes. I mean, I can just look at 1, 0, but uh, let's look at these two. Now, when I apply my uh, transformation, I want this frame to uh, be rotated by theta degrees. That is to say, um, 
So here's a circle. So now when I rotate this by theta degrees, let's say it's over here. And because this is 90 degrees, the other one should be like so. Okay? And this angle right here is theta. Now, how can I figure out what the matrix is? All I need to do, uh, as in this case, is to figure out the numerical expressions for these two vectors. Again, this is 1, 0. This is 0, 1. Well, that is to say, this is the unit circle. From basic trigon trigonometry, I know that the coordinates of this red vector is cosine of theta and sine of theta. Okay. Any ideas as to what the coordinates of this blue vector is or are? Just minus cos theta, sine theta? Exactly. You need to have a minus because uh, you see it's a, it's a negative. It's in the negative. So minus cosine theta sine. Um, it's the other way around, yeah. Sorry. So you see, uh, sine is this length, right? Mm -hmm. It's the opposite length. So, Wait. it's the vertical length. Well, I mean, vertical or horizontal, it depends on your perspective. Because you, you started counting from here. Um, so, this is the angle I can use. Uh, this is the triangle I can use, right? So, this has length 1, this is cosine, and this is sine. Here, I'm seeing this triangle rotated, rotated like this. Okay. But then, I need to have a minus here because uh, the x-coordinate is minus. Thank you. Oh. So this is minus sine of theta, cosine of theta. Based on what we discussed over there or here, I know by now that the matrix for A has to be cosine of theta, minus sine of theta, sine of theta, cosine of theta. <laughs> minus sine of theta, cosine of theta. Okay? Is this, does this make sense? Now you see once you have matrices and once we can interpret matrices as linear transformations, uh, you can extract a lot of information out of them. For instance, let's say that you've forgotten this um, formula for trigonometry that tells you something about the cosine of the sum of two angles or the sine of the sum of two angles. You can leverage your understanding of matrices to figure out the formulas, like so. You can say the following. Let's say that first I rotate my plane by alpha degrees, and then after that, I rotate my plane by beta degrees, okay? So rotate by alpha and then rotate by beta. Alpha and beta are angles. Clearly, based on our geometric understanding, the end result I should, be, I should be able to obtain by doing only one transformation, which is just rotating by alpha plus beta degrees. Maybe I should write it the other way around. It's the same, of course. But, uh, 
Okay? Now, I know um, the entries of all of these matrices. Let's write it out. Okay? Let's say that I started with xy here. If I start with xy there, now here I have yet another vector, which I can just obtain by multiplying. Okay? Uh, maybe I should write it bigger. I'm going to write it bigger. So, um, If I start with a vector x, y here, when I apply r sub alpha to it, I get yet another vector, now in this plane, and whose coordinates I can just write, down, or write out using this uh, matrix. So this is x times cosine of theta minus sine of, uh, sorry, y times sine of theta is the first uh, row. And then in the second row, I have x times sine of theta plus y times uh, not theta, of course, that's alpha. Okay? I just wrote out the, ex the, the expression r alpha times xy. But then this is a new vector, and I can apply this transformation yet again to it, and I get uh, the following. So this is the new x, so to speak. So this is. Um, x cosine of alpha minus y sine of alpha times cosine of beta. Okay, I'm not done. Plus this entry, x sine of alpha plus y cosine of alpha times that other entry, which is a minus sine beta. This is the first entry. And then there's a second entry that I'm not going to write down. There's a similar entry that you can write down. And likewise, you can just say, oh, I can just uh, take this matrix and apply it to here. So from here, all I get is this. So x times cosine of alpha plus beta minus y times, y times sine of alpha plus beta. And again, there's a second entry. Now, once you complete this, uh, these matrices, and once you uh, match the corresponding entries, you're going to realize that this, uh, whatever this was, this geometric interpretation, first rotate by alpha and then beta, whatever expression you have here is going to coincide with cosine of alpha plus beta. It is going to produce for you this trigonometry formula. Cosine of alpha plus beta is the product of some other things. Okay. I'm not writing it down because uh, we're running out of time, but this is a good exercise. I highly recommend that you do this. Check. Check that this is true. That is to say, your geometric understanding, your geometric interpretation of matrices in this way somehow supports uh, trigonometry, carries all the information you need for trigonometry, or most of it at least. Okay. Now, there's a third type of uh, transformation that is very important. It's called a shear. Um, and shears typically fix one of the coordinates, and the other, the other coordinate, it moves a little bit. It shears the other coordinate. So consider this, um, 1, 1, 0, 1. This is a shear. Shear y-axis. Okay. Now if I plug in one zero here, it's gonna produce for me one zero. So the x-axis is left uh, unchanged. 
But you see, when I plug in 0, 1, which is the vertical axis, uh, vertical uh, vector, this matrix produces for me 1, 1. Okay? It shears this to uh, this. Okay? This is yet another important uh, transformation. It turns out that these are really the, uh, all the transformations you can have, uh, linear transformations you can have for the plane. But um, maybe we'll talk about that next week. Maybe you're going to see that in the form of a problem in a problem set. Uh, but in any event, I think it's a good place to stop. Thank you, and I'll see you on Monday.